Whew, that's bright. Good evening. I'm Ann Beeson with the Open Society Institute. <coughs> I've chosen a passage from the classic Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. <coughs> In addition to this book's um, iconic status as an act of literary defiance and the many acts of defiance by its central characters in the story, <clears throat> I thought that the subject matter of the book was particularly relevant today during the economic crisis <clears throat> as poor people and immigrant workers continue in this country every day to suffer and to rise up and protest against the failures of the state and the excesses of the privileged. <clears throat> Once California belonged to Mexico and its land to Mexicans, and a horde of tattered, feverish Americans poured in. And such was their hunger for land that they took the land, stole Sutter's land, Guerrero's land, took the grants, and broke them up, and growled and quarreled over them, those frantic, hungry men. And they guarded with guns the land that they had stolen. They put up houses and barns, they turned the earth and planted crops, and these things were possession and possession was ownership. The Mexicans were weak and fed. They could not resist because they wanted nothing in the world as frantically as the Americans wanted land. Then with time, the squatters were no longer squatters, but owners, and their children grew up and had children on the land. And the hunger was gone from them, the feral hunger, the gnawing, tearing hunger for land, for water and earth and the good sky over it, for the green thrusting grass, for the swelling roots. They had these things so completely that they did not know about them anymore. They had no more the stomach-tearing lust for a rich acre and a shining blade to plow it, for seed and a windmill beating its wings in the air. They arose in the dark no more to hear the sleepy birds first chittering and the morning wind around the house while they waited for the first light to go out to the deer acres. These things were lost and crops were reckoned in dollars and land was valued by principal plus interest and crops were bought and sold before they were planted. Then crop failure, drought, and flood were no longer little deaths within life but simple losses of money. And all their love was thinned with money, and all their fierceness dribbled away in interest until they were no longer farmers at all, but little shopkeepers of crops, little manufacturers who must sell before they can make. Then those farmers who were not good shopkeepers lost their land to good shopkeepers. No matter how clever, how loving a man might be with earth and growing things, he could not survive if he were also not a good shopkeeper. And as time went on, the businessmen had the farms, and the farms grew larger, but there were fewer of them. Now farming became industry, and the owners followed Rome, although they did not know it. They imported slaves, although they did not call them slaves. Chinese, Japanese, Mexican, Filipinos. They live on rice and beans, the businessmen said. They don't need much. They wouldn't know what to do with good wages. Why, look how they live. Why, look what they eat. And if they get funny, just deport them. And all the time, the farms grew larger and the owners fewer. And there were pitifully few farmers on the land anymore. And the imported serfs were beaten and frightened and starved until some went home again. And some grew fierce and were killed or driven from the country. And the farms grew larger and the owners fewer. And the crops changed. Fruit trees took the place of grain fields and vegetables to feed the world spread out on the bottoms. Lettuce, cauliflower, artichokes, potatoes, stoop crops. A man may stand to use a sieve, a plow, a pitchfork, a pitchfork, but he must crawl like a bug between the rows of lettuce. He must bend his back and pull his long bag between the cotton rows. He must go on his knees like a penitent across a cauliflower patch. And it came about that owners no longer worked on their farms. They, they farmed on paper and they forgot the land, the smell, the feel of it, and remembered only what they owned it, only that they owned it, remembered only what was gain and loss by it. And then the dispossessed were drawn west from Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, from Nevada and Arkansas families, tribes dusted out, tractored out, car loads, caravans, homeless and hungry, 20,000 and 50,000 and 100,000 and 200,000. They streamed over the mountains, hungry and restless, restless as ants, scurrying to find work to do, to lift, to push, to pull, to pick, to cut, anything, any burden to bear for food. The kids are hungry, we've got no place to live like ants scurrying for work, for food, and most of all, for land. We ain't foreign. Seven generations back, Americans, and beyond that, Irish, Scotch, English, German, one of our folks in the Revolution. And they was lots of our folks in the Civil War, both sides, Americans. They were hungry and they were fierce. And they had hoped to find a home and they found only hatred. Okies, the owners hated them because the owners knew they were soft and the Okies strong, that they were fed and the Okies hungry. And perhaps the owners had heard from their grandfathers how easy it is to steal land from a soft man if you are fierce and hungry and armed. The owners hated them. And in the towns, the shopkeepers hated them because they had no money to spend. 
There was no shorter path to a shopkeeper's contempt and all his admirations were exactly opposite. The town men, little bankers, hated Okies because there was nothing to gain from them. They had nothing. And the laboring people hated Okies because a hungry man must work and if he must work, if he has to work, the wage payer automatically gives him less for his work and then no one can get more. And the dispossessed, the migrants, flowed into California, 250,000 and 300,000. Behind them, new tractors were going on the land and the tenants were being forced off. And new waves were on the way, new waves of the dispossessed and the homeless, hardened, intent, and dangerous. And while the Californians wanted many things, accumulation, social success, amusement, luxury, and a curious banking security, the new barbarians wanted only two things, land and food. And to them, the two were one. And whereas the wants of the Californians were nebulous and undefined, the wants of the Okies were beside the roads, lying there to be seen and coveted. The good fields, with water to be dug for, the good green fields, earth to crumble experimentally in the hand, grass to smell, oaten stalks to chew until the sharp sweetness was in the throat. A man might look at a fallow field and know, and see in his mind, that his own bending back and his own straining arms would bring the cabbages into the light and the golden eating corn the turnips and the carrots, and a homeless, hungry man driving the roads with his wife beside him and his thin children in the back seat could look at the fallow fields which might produce food but not profit, and that man could know how a fallow field is a sin and the unused land a crime against the thin children. And such a man drove along the roads and knew temptation at every field and knew the lust to take these fields and make them grow strength for his children and a little comfort for his wife. The temptation was always before him. The fields goaded him and the company ditches with good water flowing were a goad to him. And in the south he saw the golden oranges hanging on the trees, the little golden oranges on the dark green trees, and guards with shotguns patrolling the lines so a man might not pick an orange for a thin child, oranges to be dumped if the price was low. He drove his old car into a town. He scoured the farms for work. Where can we sleep tonight? Well, there's a Hooverville on the edge of the river. There's a whole raft of Okies out there. He drove his old car to Hooverville. He never asked again, for there was a Hooverville on the edge of every town. The rag town lay close to water, and the houses were tents and weed-thatched enclosures. Paper houses, a great junk pile. The man drove his family in and became a citizen of Hooverville. Always they were called that. The man put up his own tent as near to water as he could get. Or if he had no tent, he went to the city dump and brought back cartons and built a house of corrugated paper. And when the rains came, the house melted and washed away. He settled in Hooverville and he scoured the countryside for work and the little money he had went for gasoline to look for work. In the evening, the men gathered and talked together, squatting on their hams. They talked to the land they had seen. There's 30,000 acres out west of here, laying there. Jesus, what could I do with that? With five acres of that? Why, hell, I'd have everything to eat. Notice one thing, there ain't no vegetables nor chickens nor pigs at those farms. They raise one thing, cotton, say, or peaches or lettuce. Another place will be all chickens. They buy the stuff they could raise in the dooryard. Jesus, what I could do with a couple of pigs. Well, it ain't yearn. It ain't going to be yearn. What are we going to do? The kids can't grow up this way. In the camps, the word would come whispering. There's work at Shafter, and the cars would be loaded in the night. The highways crowded, a gold rush for work. At Shafter, the people would pile up five times too many to do the work, a gold rush for work. They stole away in the night, frantic for work, and along the roads lay the temptations, the fields that could bear food. That's owned. That ain't arn. Well, maybe we could get a little piece of her, maybe a little piece. Right down there, a patch. Jimson weed now. Christ, I could get enough potatoes off in that little patch to feed my whole family. It ain't arn. You gotta have jimson weeds. Now and then a man tried, crept on the land and cleared a piece, trying like a thief to steal a little richness from the earth. Secret gardens hidden in the weeds. A package of carrot seeds and a few turnips. Planted potato skins crept out in the evening secretly to hoe in the silent earth. Leave the weeds around the edge, then nobody can see what we were doing. Leave some weeds, big tall ones in the middle. Secret gardening in the evenings and water carried in a rusty can. And then one day a deputy sheriff. Well, what you think you're doing? I ain't doing no harm. I had my eye on you. This ain't your land. You're trespassing. The land ain't plowed. I ain't hurting no one. You goddamn squatters. Pretty soon you'd think you owned it. You'd be sore as hell. Then you'd think you'd owned it. Get off now. And the little green carrot tops were kicked off and the turnip greens trampled. And then the jimson weed moved back in, but the cop was right. A crop raised. Why, that makes ownership. Land hoed and the carrots eaten. A man might fight for land he's taken food from. Get him off quick. He'll think he owns it. He might even die fighting for the little plot among the jimson weeds. Did you see his face when we kicked them, tur them terminates out? Why, he'd kill a fellow as soon as he'd look at him. We gotta keep these people down or they'll take the country. They'll take the country. Outlanders, foreigners. 
Sure, they talk the same language, but they ain't the same. Look how they live. Think any of those folks that live like that? Hell no. In the evening, squatting and talking, and an excited man. Why ain't 20 of us take a piece of land? We got guns. Take it and say, put us off if you can. Why don't we just do that? They just shoot us like rats. Well, which you'd rather be, dead or here? Underground or in a house all made of gunny sacks? Which you'd rather be for your kids, dead now or dead in two years with what they call malnutrition? Know what we had all week? Biled nettles and fried dough. Know where we got the flour for the dough? Swept the floor of a boxcar. Talking in the camps and the deputies, fat-ass men with guns slung on fat hips, swaggering through the camps. Give them something to think about. Got to keep them in line or Christ only knows what they'll do. Why, Jesus, they're as dangerous as niggers in the South. If they ever get together, there ain't nothing that'll stop them. Thank you. <clears throat>